Hey, I am Al Paul. I'm one of the support analysts uh, back for calendar year 2014 to continue our series of what we hope are helpful webinars. Now, first of all, some mundane housekeeping. As usual, we're going to run this on mute today because the audio really does work better. Questions will be handled after the session, not during. If you have a question, email it to our support staff like any other question. That way you're helping us manage any questions you might have, and that helps us ensure that we follow up properly. We are recording this session today. You're lucky. Uh, it's audio only. I still do not have a webcam. This presentation itself, including the audio, will be posted on the Internet. And you can link to it from our community pages. You see the address here, community.schoollogic.com. We'll be using School Logic 3.1.283 today, but any recent vintage will give you the same choices we're going to talk about. And, and hey, I'm going to offer you a little side note here to my friends that run School Logic. School Logic and Teacher Logic should work in any of the modern browsers: Safari, Firefox, Chrome, Internet Explorer. IE remains our preferred browser. And sometimes you'll see like small abnormalities in some of the other browsers. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Today, when I'm running this, I'm going to be running uh, Chrome, Google Chrome. And in Google Chrome, uh, these are little slider bars, right? And there's no little arrow on the top and the bottom. If I open the same page in Internet Explorer, there'd be a little arrow here and a little arrow here. Okay. So if you run something other than IE, that's the sort of thing you can expect, some minor business like that where, you know, something not earth-shaking maybe isn't quite right. Now, frankly, we've gotten a lot better at this. Three years ago, sometimes in Chrome, there was an occasional clickable link that wouldn't click. You'll see me um, running a day in Chrome, but, but to be totally, totally honest, I got blindsided in, in the last month by IE11. I ran too many Windows updates without checking what they really were, and my machine catapulted from IE9 to IE11 without me realizing it. Now, you'd expect somebody in the tech industry to pay a little more attention, wouldn't you? The only reason I bring all this up is we've seen some abnormalities with school logic and IE11, particularly in regards to reports and our report manager. So if you think something's goofy in this area and you're running IE11 or maybe even IE10, you may have to futz with, now that, that's a technical term, you know, the compatibility view settings. It seems like you have to be in the product you're worried about first. So if you're in school logic and the reports aren't quite, you're not getting a choice you think you should have, or you try to go to report manager, and that's not working out for you, go to the Tools menu in IE 11 and pick Compatibility View. And it seems like you have to be in School Logic first in order for you to make that choice. And then I'm a little frustrated because it doesn't seem to hold the choice. You come back the next day and you have to go do that again. So if I had my druthers, I would still be running IE 9 on my machine, but that's the first of what might be several digressions today, but I thought I, I should mention that because we've seen a couple things in IE 11. Choices are what we're going to spend most of our time talking about today. Semester end update is like many of the more involved processes in our software. The actual process itself is somewhat anticlimactic. Well, at least it is if you make the right choices along the way. The choices you make leading up to that final process, those choices are the big deal. And so that's where we're going to invest most of our time today. And if we get the choices right, the semester end update process will go swimmingly. All of your first term grades will copy smoothly into history. We'll gain notoriety, we'll get huge bonuses, and we'll retire someplace warm. Oh, okay, okay, I can't guarantee the notoriety, I can't guarantee the money, I can't guarantee the someplace warm. So we should probably get down to business here. And I promise you this, you folks are seated across three different time zones today, but it's Friday in each of them, 
and I promise you I'll have you out of here in well under an hour. Let's start with an interview overview of the, the process. This is, you gotta love this in Windows 7. And it's gonna come back in a minute and it's gonna say, oh look, I did this for you. I made the, uh, what it's doing is it's dumbing down the resolution because I'm doing the go-to webinar business. Semester end update, we start with a whole bunch of investigation, a whole bunch of research before we get to the actual SEU screen. We're going to spend a little bit of time in preferences, not a great deal of time, but there are a couple things there to look at. There are a number of settings in courses and classes that matter. Mark's entry is kind of the whole point of this, of a semester end update. So we're, we're, it's, we got to verify that the teachers have done their part of the work, which is get the marks in. And then a part of that verification is, did our software do its part of the work, which is assign credits? Then we actually come to the semester end update, that's what SEU stands for, report options tab. This is where you actually do the work, but you don't do the work right away because first there's an important report that we preview from here. And based on what we learn in the report, we make changes if needed. And then we run the actual process. Okay, now the good news is I'm not going to run the actual process today because that will keep our time together shorter. And then once one runs this, you verify the results. So pretty, pretty straightforward step-by-step-by-step -step -step deal. And as I said, we're going to start in preferences. Let's go to school logic because these slides are not that much fun. We want to go to setup. We want to choose preferences. This will take a second to come up. Once we get to preferences, we're looking for grades. And once we get to grades, we're looking for the sixth one from the top, which is move midterm grades to history. Now, to even be concerned about this part of the preferences, you have to have at least some year-long classes. If all of your classes are semesterized, this doesn't really apply to you. If your classes only last one semester, there really isn't a midterm grade to move to history. The class usually ends in quarter two or quarter four, and you move that grade to history. If your class is defined as having a final grade, well, OK, then the final grade moves. Now, for all this to come into play, this preference, right, you've got to have at least one year-long class. Most folks have four quarters in their year. Your class lasts to all four quarters. But by engaging this first, this choice, you create the opportunity to move not just the fourth quarter grade to history, but maybe the second quarter grade. Now, it's important to understand that preferences don't exist in a vacuum. They work hand in hand with choices that you make in other places. In this case, in class setup and schedule. So in class setup and schedule, in this particular database, I've got one class that is set up as a year-long class, general applied math. Here's my setup. You'll see I've got both terms checked because I'm offering this in both terms. I'm taking a report card at every reporting period, and you notice I'm going out to history twice. In preferences, I created the opportunity to make these choices that you see here. It's these choices here that actually tell the system to move these grades and these grades out when you run the semester end update. Notice also that we're awarding half of the credit for the class in semester one and half the credits for the class in semester two. If you go to information, you'll see that this class is worth half a credit. Let's trace that out. I got a quarter credit here, I got a quarter credit here, everybody's happy. The credit situation, by the way, this ability to divide the credits between two different locations, is not powered by the choice I showed you in preferences. This credit situation is made possible by a setting in courses called allow duplicate credits. And I'll come back to that later. For now, we are going to go to courses and I want to look in courses at information tab. I want to look at my accounting class. So here's my accounting class. Here's my information tab. Now, 
what sorts of pieces of information are important to the semester end update? Well, there's a guy called exam types. This is particularly important for the Alberta schools, and I believe the BC schools make use of this too. If this matters to you, not only do you want to make sure that you have the correct one, because you can have different choices, of course, you want to make sure that there's one here at all. Okay? If this matters to you, something's got to be in this box, because in some state reporting scenarios, if this field is blank, the system doesn't believe this course should be moved, reported out in government reports. I should also note that in class setup and schedule, there's a place for department exam that's independent of this entry. If this is important to you, somebody in your management has probably already told you that. Everybody cares about government course code. This is huge. Make sure this is right before you report this course and its classes to your government. And today, you want to make sure you get it right before you send the courses and classes to history. What about credit values? Over here, I've got a low credit value. I've got a high credit value. These are really important for the semester end update and obviously for the kid moving on toward graduation. Here in courses, you establish the overall range. Okay. Now let's trace these out. Let's go to class setup and schedule, and let's find my accounting S1 class. Here it is. Now remember we had a range there of 0 to 2. Here I've got a credit of 0.5. So in this particular class, that's the amount of credit, maximum amount of credit this kid can earn. If you're enrolled in a class, you can buy into that. Of course, you have to get a grade that is high enough to receive credits. And we'll come back to that thought, too. Back in the course setup, there's an interesting piece out here in information number two called minimal grade. If you leave this at zero, this number right here, it means that every kid who takes the course, even if they score a zero, gets credit for the course. Most schools, most of the time, don't set it at zero. You probably want to set it at 50 or so. Whatever the specific number you choose is your business. But I just wanted to remind you how this works, because whatever number you enter here, if the student scores this number or above, the kid gets credit for taking the course. Okay, So that kind of plays into what I was mentioning a minute ago about the credits. Another thing to consider is back on the information tab, column number three, the second guy up, really the second guy from the bottom, allow duplicate credits. You engage this if you allow students to take the same course twice. Or if you engage in one of the scenarios like I showed you earlier in that general math class where I had a year-long course, but I wanted to assign part credit at each semester. Now, you and I might think that assigning a quarter credit first semester and a quarter credit second semester is not truly duplicate credits, but that's not the way the system thinks. Okay, Our system believes that the student should really only get credit once. So if you're going to take and divide your credits among different semesters, you've got to turn this guy on. Out of the box, School Logic and even SERS figures the kid is going to receive credit toward graduation in only one reporting period in each class. This is your opportunity right here to declare otherwise. What about classes? We're talking about here about courses. Let's go look at class setup and schedule. What else we got there that's interesting? Middle column, fourth one from the top, exam date. If you do diploma submissions or some of the other provincial and state reporting stuff, this matters. And again, if this matters, your management's probably already told you that. Credit value, here we go. We looked at this a minute ago. This is accounted for in the setup screen because I've got my quarter credit here, right? Someplace in the setup screen, I'm going to award that quarter credit. Now, this is semesterized class. This is set up differently from the general math course I showed you earlier. Here, this is a more conventional way to establish a course. I'm going to do my reporting at first quarter. I'm going to do my reporting at second quarter. And then at second quarter, I'm going to go to history. 
because this is a semesterized class. It only lasts one semester. And of course, when I go to history, that's when I'm applying my credit. Where did my credit come from? It came from back here. Where did this credit number come from? It's within the range I established back in courses. Another thing that we worry about when we're doing a semester end update is we care about, is it a final grade? In semester end update, if I say no to this, then the grade that the kid earns in the quarter, in the second quarter, is the grade that moves to history. If I say yes to final grades, or if I want to calculate a final grade, either one of these choices, then when I go to history, the grade that moves to history is the final grade. And of course, the credits move out. Now, all of these choices we've been talking about, they can be important for your student's basic history, your student's progress toward graduation. These things can be important for some of the provincial and state reporting. And choices like this are directly related to telling the semester end update what goes where. So all of the stuff that we've looked at so far will matter in one or more of those areas. Which brings us to Mark's entry. Since the main point of a semester end update is moving grades and other information to history, it pretty much goes without saying that you need to have all of the marks entry completed, whether your teachers are working in teacher logic or directly in school logic. Now, most of the people that have signed up for this little webinar today are office folks and administrators. Well, how do you guys know if the teachers did their job? Well. Not surprisingly, there are several ways that we can, let's say, check up on them. There, I'm going to show you about three or four different reports that you can run. And I'll tell you again at the end of this what I'm going to tell you now. You don't have to run all three or four of the reports. Find one of these three or four reports that you like, that gives you the information you want in a timely fashion, and, and use it. The first one I'm going to show you, we're going to go to grades, we're going to go to grade reports, and we're going to pick grade entry status. Now, this is, a, believe it or not, not always an accurate representation if you're in a, a semester situation where there should be two marks, where there should be a term mark and a final mark. Sometimes a user will enter the term mark but forget to enter the final mark or vice versa. Either way, the grade she misses won't appear on this report. But if there's at least one mark on this report, then the report says, OK. So if you should have two or three marks in a given report period, and the system sees one, it'll print that one. It'll say, OK. On the other hand, if you see undone, you can be sure that none of the marks for that student for this report period have been entered. Let's just look at this guy, grade entry status. We're going to pick which quarter we're interested in. Okay? I'm, by the way, all of the semester end update business that you attend to, you attend to as a building person. Semester end update is something that's done at a building level. And you'll see in this particular building, I only have one track, and I have my four quarters. So we're going to pick my only track. We're in term one, quarter two. And it's telling me what report period that is. I could say, I want you to report on a grade entered between this date and this date. I'm going to just stick with the quarter grades. Do I want to do one page per teacher? Maybe I do. But what I'm going to do is I've selected all my staff. I've selected all my classes. There's nothing else going on out here. I'm going to go ahead and say, preview the report. Now. I could see, by the way, a, a teacher, a, a school doing one teacher per page. That could make a lot of sense. But in an environment like this where I just want to show you the report, hey, I'm going to just run the teachers together. Otherwise, you know, if you do one teacher per page, each teacher gets their own page. You could print this report to paper. You could put it in their mailbox. On the other hand, if you're trying to go paperless, you could invent, invest a bunch of time in printing one page PDFs. I wouldn't find that terribly attractive. You could print this entire report to PDF and give the entire report to each teacher. After all, the students' individual grades are not on here. 
you wouldn't be showing teacher B what teacher A gave. You're only showing which sections do not have grades assigned. And I might point out there's the embarrassment factor there. You know, you might be able to work that to your advantage. I, I don't know. But if you're showing teacher B how many grades teacher A has yet to enter, uh, teacher A might want to get on the stick. Just a thought. You know your staff way better than I do. Sociology in the workplace setting that we call schools is always interesting. Here's what the report shows us. By teacher, I'm getting a list of all the classes that teacher teaches, how many kids are enrolled in it, and how many grades are recorded. Well, here I've got three grades for three kids. The computer says that's OK. One grade for one kid, the computer says that's OK. Zero grades for one kid, the computer says that's a problem. So on this report, if I am seeing undone, it means that nothing is entered. Here I've got a class of 24 students, and I've recorded three grades. That's incomplete. Okay? So this, I'm not looking at the individual grades. I'm just saying, how many kids are there? How many grades has the teacher entered? There's another report that I'm guessing most of you may already be familiar with called grade verification. If I go to grade reports, and I pick grade verification. Many schools print this off for teachers, and they actually have them sign it and stuff. I want to get the report running before I talk too much about it. Um, I've got all my staff members selected. I've got all my classes selected. I still want to do term one, quarter two. For my middle schools or even elementaries, I could show life skills, course objectives, if those are important to me. I believe out here in filters, I can tell it, hey, page break on teacher change. So each teacher is going to get their own page. And then to speed life up today, I'm telling the computer here to only pick my seniors. Now, like I said, many schools will print this off for teachers. They print it to paper. They give it to them in their mailboxes. They have the teacher sign or initial it, and they hand it back in the office. Now, by the way, this is kind of a big report. You may want to run this in groups of teachers if you have a big operation. It brings in all the marks. It can also bring in the comments. Some schools will control this from the office. They print it. They put it in the teacher mailbox. Teachers sign it, bring it back in. After that, the office could print report cards because, hey, what are we verifying here? We're verifying that the grades are in, and now it's time to print report cards. Or you can print. You could run this semester end update. Now. Those two sentences together kind of compress the timeline. I don't really mean to do that. Technically, school logic would allow you to print the report cards either before or after you run the semester end update. Those are independent ideas. In practice, most schools run the report cards. They let the dust settle from that. You know, After all, there is the occasional grade change right? that happens after report cards are printed. If I were you, I would wait for all of those changes to be set in stone, and then I would run the semester end update. So OK, let's see what we get in this report. This report is organized by teacher. Each page is a different teacher. My first class here, uh, grammar, the kids get in a quarter grade, and the kids get in the final grade. Got to like that. Next class, I've got read 180. Well, I've only got one kid, but the kid's got no grades, so we're going to have to go t talk. This is a group teaching effect, OK? I got three teachers here. Nobody's done the work yet. Each teacher is waiting for the other teacher to enter the grades. In advanced physics, this is that class that we saw in the other report where there's 24 kids, but there's only a few grades entered. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing quarter grades entered. We're seeing absences. Uh, not absences. Well, we are seeing absences, if I would have said to do that. But we're seeing these are out here the final grades. Okay, These are the grades because the class has both. right? We told it back in, in setup that we're going to have a final grade. The final grade is a grade that goes to history when I get that far. And yes, I really can print the comments. That's what's going on here. Get both the quarter mark and the final mark. Um, you know, This is a report you probably don't want to share between teachers because, yeah, you're giving them the actual individual student grades. If I go to grades and I pick grade reports, the final report I wanted to show you here was the grade analysis report. And the grade analysis report, um, don't you love doing live demos? If you don't, you move your mouse just right. It's not going where you want it to go. Grade analysis report is interesting. 
because you can do a lot of things with this. You can do more than just a semester end update. This report, too, can take a little time to actually run. It's best, because uh, to, to get very specific criteria, you can get really specific stuff on this report. It's probably underutilized overall, but it could work great for semester end update. Notice on the left, you can pick current year, or you can pick history, or you can pick both. Now, 20 minutes from now, when I'm about done with this, I'm going to tell you that at the end of the semester on the update process, you should go back and you should verify what actually got moved to history. Well, look at this. The grade analysis report lets you pick. You can print right out of history, school grades, final grades. You can pick which years you're going to run. So this could be happy later on, too. But up front, I would pick period grades. Um, I'm, I can actually print more than one report period at a time, although that's not our goal with semester end update, part of it. Again, I'm going to pick just my seniors because I want the report to go pretty fast. In additional options, you've got to have the right course type selected. In this particular school, I only need to pick U's and GPA. I'm going to choose to print both numeric and alpha grades because it's fun. In the middle, which courses do I care about? Out here on the right, I'm going to say which grade levels do I care about. Now, it's important to realize that when this says grade levels, it means which courses, because courses are generally associated with grade levels, as opposed to the grade level of the kid, which I still filter up here in group manager just like I always do in all the other reports. And then I've got an alpha grades filter here. Obviously, in semester and update, I want everything, you know, I pretty much want everything turned on. But when I talk about grade analysis report doing a ton of stuff, you know, you could come back on a different day and you could do some kind of report like grade distribution, A's distribution, all this sort of thing. Now, the, the interesting one here is the low grade, high grade. And I'll come back to this later. But for now, I'm going to say the lowest grade I want is a zero. Because I want to know, does the teacher have the grades input yet? That's really what this whole business is about. In sorting, I'm going to say I'm going to group this by staff. Obviously, I could group it by class student course. So I'm going to get that running. That grade range thing, we'll come back to that. For some other uses of this report, you know, you might pick 48 or 49. Let's say that the minimum grade you allow in your school is a 50. Well, if you pick 48 or 49 on that low grade and then you tell it to run, you're going to pick up errors. You know, you're going to pick up have teachers made some mistakes. Then this report, because this report will, you know, if you set it at 48, it's going to print every grade from 48 and above. So I'll let you check up on what the grades have been entered by the teachers. Are mistakes being made out there? Today for semester end update, you know, I said the lower grade to zero allows you to see which teachers didn't get their marks in. That's really what this is about. You don't want to run semester end update without all your grades being entered. So now, what did we get? We got teacher, class, kid name, grade level. Here's the grade the kid got, and here's his government number. You know, really the only thing we want to look at here for the purposes of semester end update is do we see gaps in the grade column? Did the teacher forget to enter a grade someplace for a kid? Okay, That's really kind of the only thing we want to do for semester end update. But if you'll permit me, I'm going to stray just a minute beyond the topic of semester end update because there are so many choices on this report. You know, you could come in here on this report and you could run an F list. You could say my lowest grade is 0, my highest grade is 49, print me an F list, right? You could narrow the low grade, high grade, low grade, high grade range to just Fs. You could run some kind of an at risk of failing report. Maybe you print a range from 60 to 70. Kids who are close to the cliff but they haven't slipped over the edge. You could do a report comparing sections or teachers to other sections or teachers. Think about that for a minute. You've got three English 9 teachers. Each of them teaches three sections of the course. Wouldn't it be cool if you could run a report comparing student by student the grades across those nine sections? Let me show you this. Let me show you the summary report. If I come in here and I say I'm not going to group by anything and I'm going to pick a summary. Okay. 
kid by kid, here's a summary of the grades the student is receiving in the grading periods I asked for. Remember, I'm only asking for quarter two here. I could ask for more than that. I could do a report where I compare quarter one to quarter two, and you look to see if progress is being made. Okay. Now, if you ask me, this whole chart kind of looks like the medal count by country that you're going to see during the Winter Olympics next month, but I digress. The reason I wanted to show you this great analysis report is because I think there's a ton of stuff you can do with it, and my, my feeling is, just from working with folks, is this report is probably underutilized because a lot of people don't know it's there. The reason you'd want to do it in this particular context, in the context of the semester end update, is simply to show who has or who is missing marks and what classes you need to go uh, ferret out the teacher and go, hey, where are my grades? Which brings us to the semester end update report option tab. We've got most of the preliminary checks done. We've done a bunch of poking and prodding, and, and maybe we've even printed some reports to paper. I should point out, you don't need to run three different reports to verify which students have or do not have grades. I mentioned that up front. I wanted to show you there are a variety of reports which could meet your needs. Your need simply is to learn which classes have their grades in because you don't want to run the actual semester end update until all of the grades that matter to you are in. By matter to you, I mean in this, whatever it is, if you're uploading, if you're moving quarter two, you care about quarter two. Most operators will find one report that tells them what they want. They stick with that report. Now, overall, so far, where have we been? We've been to a, a verified a number of settings and preferences. We've been to courses. We've been to classes. We've invested considerable effort in learning the students really do have second quarter grade. So let's go look at the actual form that does the actual work. And we're going to go to grades, and we're going to pick semester end update. Let's consider our choices here. At the very top, I've got I'm going to pick the term I want. Uh, it says terms with an S. I have no idea why they printed that up that way, because you only run this report one term at a time. Notice also we only do one track at a time. In fact, I have only two terms, right, first semester, second semester. These are terms as opposed to reporting periods. So I'm going to go with term one. Now, if you've heard a rumor that you don't have to do a semester up, end update, that rumor is actually true, particularly if you're in middle school. If you're in middle school who is not concerned about non-diploma course marks, not concerned about transcripts for colleges, you may not have any incentive to do a semester end update now. And in fact, if you're in middle school and a year from now you don't care what Johnny's grade was in seventh grade basket weaving, you don't have to do this at all. But most people like to have that information down the road. What I want you guys to remember is this. If you don't do the semester end update now, cool. But when you get around to doing it, you have to do them in order. Okay. If you choose to wait until the summer to do both semester end updates, you can't run. I mean, the system would allow you to run term two first and then go back and do term one. And you do that, and you're going to be on the phone with 800-265-6670. So if you don't do them now, that's fine. But when you get around to doing them, do them in order. Now, and, and why are high schools doing this now? Because it either has something to do with your state or provincial reporting, or more commonly, high schools are moving term one marks and credits to history so that they can print transcripts which shows seven semesters worth of grades for their seniors. By the way, when you're working on this screen, pay attention to the fact that you what you got going on here, because this will always default to term one. So if you go and if you leave this and come back and you're doing this in the middle of the summer and you want to do term two, I'm telling you it'll default to term one every time. Let's look a little farther along in the report here. Exclude students withdrawn from school on or before a certain date. This question means, do I want to exclude from the semester end update 
students who have withdrawn not from an individual class, but students who have withdrawn from my building. Which students? Students who withdrew from your school during the term you're working with. Students who withdrew after this date have the same rules applied to them as currently enrolled students. Conversely, a student who withdrew before this date, their information never gets over to history. Okay, No harm, no foul. What many schools do is they pick a day maybe about three weeks into the school year. So I'm going to go in here. Here's September 23rd. I'm going to pick the 23rd of 2000. You know, makes sense, right? I'm about three weeks into the school year. Many schools will pick a date like that. It means that if Melissa withdrew from your school before September 23rd, her grades don't move on. Don't get copied into history. Real straightforward. The next one is exclude students withdrawn from courses. So you guys got to have your wits about you here. Top line says school, bottom line says courses. The basic premise, though, is the same. In your school, how long does a student have to be in a course in order to have their grades move to history? That's what you're answering here. Many schools will have a similar couple weeks. You know, my school year started on September 2, but that was Labor Day, so kids were really in, in the rooms on 3 September. And maybe I'm going to say I'm going to give them two weeks for drop and add, and maybe 16 September, now it's starting to count. If a student withdrew from a course on or before September 16, that course doesn't get moved to history. If they withdrew later, their stuff follows them around. Okay, Real simple. The next one is completion status, almost simpler. I'm going to say completed. What we're asking here is we're talking about courses which ended in either quarter one or quarter two. What completion code do you want the system to enter on those classes? Which, by the way, are the classes being moved to history? I can't really think of a reason to pick something other than completed. So who moves? Well, in this chart on the right, we pick the grade levels of the students you wish to move to history. Now, this is pretty straightforward. It's inclusionary. You check the grade level, the grade level moves. But, but here's a little thought. If you're a very large school, you might pick only one or two grades for a couple of reasons. First of all, if you pick two grades, the actual semester end update process runs faster. That's cool, but there's another reason. I'll give you a little sneak peek here. I'm going to tell you that on the road between where we are now and running the actual semester end update, there's another report. The report is going to clue you in on every course and every grade and every credit that's getting copied to history. Well, if you want that report to run pretty quickly in a large environment, Maybe you only pick a couple of grades at a time. Something to think about. And this, of course, is where you make the choice. I'm going to just pick my 12th graders. These four statements out here on the left, okay? most people most of the time engage them all. Let me tell you about those. Sit really close to your monitor, because this is really small type. Do I want to move the government course code into history? Most schools most of the time are going to say yes to that. Do I wish to indicate? exclude from average for subjects that have no grade. So if I'm moving the history a grade that's blank, do I want to exclude that from doing averages, averages like GPAs? Most people most of the time will say yes. And then the bottom one is actually the most, uh, oh, I missed one here. Do I want to exclude master classes from history? Master classes tend to be an Albertan thing, but I know that other people have some too. The grades aren't generally stored in the master classes anyway. They're stored in the subclasses. So why would I want to move the master class to history? That's kind of the way I look at that. The bottom one, this is the interesting one. Minimum equivalent grade to include in history. I advocate zero. That means every class goes. You can't score lower than a zero, right? And you're saying every class with a grade of zero or above gets moved to history. I think that's nice. If I place a higher number here, let's say I place a 50, right? 
If a kid scores 49, I don't know, she spent most of her class period texting. I, I, for whatever reason, she's got a 49. That 49 won't get moved to history. Well, don't you want the evidence in history? So I advocate zero in this box so that all of the process, all the classes move. Okay? Now, this is where the process gets tricky. First time users tend to come in here, they make all these choices, and they click submit, and they expect that because they clicked submit, the actual semester end update runs. It doesn't. The actual copying of grades to credits in history doesn't happen yet. This is what happens. When you click submit, you get the semester end update report. It will show you student by student and class by class within those, that student schedule it will show you exactly which pieces of information are going to be stored in history. If you, let's look at this second kid, Jordan Bowden. Here's his class. This is the uh, government number for the course. Here's the kid's grade, 85.5. He's getting half a credit. Same class, different student. He's getting a 97. He's getting 0.5 credits. Same credits because they're all above that minimal grade. Okay. Now. Notice on the bottom on the right, I could print this to paper. Or if you have a PDF printer installed, you could print this out to PDF. OK. If it were me, I would hit print. And as soon as I did that, I would click no. In fact, I would advocate that you click no before you leave your desk to walk to the printer to get the printout. The semester end update process will only proceed if you click yes. And what I don't want to have happen is I don't want you to have that report up on your screen, have you walk away, and have some coworker charmingly click yes while you're gone. Okay? Stranger things have happened. Now, you can loop through this as many doggone times as you need to. So my suggestion is you print the report to paper, you close this. If there are things you need to edit, you go edit them in the actual data. And then you come back here and you click Submit again, because remember you closed this. You click Submit again, and you print the report out again. And you go through the report to make sure the changes you made showed up. Remember, you want to have all of your ducks in a row before you proceed to actually clicking yes. Once you do have all your ducks in a row, I would add this. If you have access to your tech staff, this would be a great time to do a backup. Right? You've run this report like two, three times because you keep making changes, you keep finding stuff wrong, you keep making changes. Now you're done with the changes, it's a good time to make a backup. Now I know that can be challenging to get this done in a multi-building district, but it never hurts. See if you can get a backup done before you move this pile of data to history. Now let me stop for a minute, because in the first, I don't know, 47 minutes that I've been talking here, I've been moving back and forth between using the word copy and the use word move. The truth is, technically, in computers, the word move implies you're moving data from one location to another, and that data will no longer be in its original location. That is not what's happening here. Technically, we are copying the student's current grades and credits to history. When this process is done, you will still be able to go into current year, and you'll see Rachel's first quarter grades. You'll see Rachel's second quarter grades. You'll see her credits in second quarter. Just so you know, we are copying information to history. It will still show up in current year. And let me carry that one step farther, because I'm kind of on a roll here. A week from now, let's say you find some extenuating circumstance. You need to change Rachel's second quarter grade from an F to a D. You can still do that in her current year marks, just like you could a week ago. The difference is you now need to also go to Rachel's grade history and make the change there. Because once you copy stuff to history, they're disassociated. There's not a direct link between entering a grade in second quarter and having them change in history. They're independent. You have to manually change the grade in both locations, just so you know.
Okay. Now back to the semester end update process. Once you've satisfied all those marks are in there, everything to your liking, you click yes. I should also point out that there's another choice for you here when this report comes up. Other than clicking yes on the bottom of the report, there's also a choice if you scroll down here, you can click on do you wish to proceed with a semester end update. Okay, either one of those and you're copying the data out to, the, to uh, history. That's it. You copy, it goes. Pretty anticlimactic, right? I told you it would be. After you've run the semester end update, and by the way, we strongly, strongly advocate that you only run the semester end update once for a given grade level and a given term. Remember, right now, if I would have done this for real, I would have just done the seniors. Okay, still got to do the other kids. We've heard some people have run semester end update twice and they've gotten away with it. Bully for them, they were lucky. We don't recommend you run semester end update more than once. But, 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 ball is not lost. In the interest of leaving you with some optimism here, I must point out that changes can be made in student history, as I alluded to a minute ago when I talked about the need to change a kid's grade. Now, making changes in student history is fairly labor intensive, but you can manually go into student history and change practically anything. Your challenge is, that everything in history is owned by an individual student. For instance, if you need to change the band grade for every kid from percussion to brass, you have to open each individual student and make the change. It's not like current year where you can open the class, there's 156 kids in one spot, and you edit their grades. It is, of course, possible to edit student history through SQL. But you didn't hear that from me. Okay. So what do we do? We spent a lot of time in the SEU report options tab because he's pretty important. The next thing we do is we verify the results. After the semester end update has been completed, verify the accuracy of course records copied to student history. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, for starters, we can go to scheduling. We can go to Class Setup and Schedule, and we can look at the Enrollment tab. In the Enrollment tab, when a kid has completed this course, and you know that's happened because he's moved to history, then the name here is not going to be in light blue, which indicates currently enrolled. The name will be highlighted in dark blue, which indicates completed. Come to this screen, look for kids highlighted in dark blue. Regular classes. The, the, here's what happens with a regular class. If you have a multiple term class, this is not going to be cleared until the final term, right? I mean, you're not going to be completed after one quarter of the class. Subclasses work that same way. If you have CTS modules, that's an Alberta thing, enrollment will be cleared during any term in which a final mark is entered. You can come to the schedule menu, you can go to student enrollment, by the way, you could also go to walk-in scheduler. You'd see the same thing. The status here, after a class has been copied to history, the status, of course, is different. It's not current anymore. It's going to show completed. And you're going to see an outdate. And just as an aside, if you manually end, ended a class early, uh, kid's going to graduate early, got done in November, whatever the story is, and you manually entered an outdate, now moving those grades to history is not going to change the outdate. That outdate will still show early. And then maybe the most obvious thing to do is you can go to grades and you can go to grade history. And you can verify that you're seeing, first of all, at this first screen, you come in here and you say, OK, do I see the courses I expect? Do I see the credits I expect? Do I see the grades I expect? You can open an individual class. And a couple things to look for here. Frankly, almost everything on grade detail one, this first tab, matters. I've got a course status buried in here somewhere. Does it say completed? Are my start and end dates within spec? Here's completion date. Here's start date. GPA number, I've got a GPA number here of 2.667. Does that make sense vis-a-vis -vis the kid getting a B minus? How does that work out? Marks. Credits earned, do I have credits earned here? Sure, I do, 0.5. Remember, if uh, Rachel fails this course, she's probably going to have a zero up there. 
That's what I would expect. I expect a zero down here too. Um, grade detail number two. Local says it's not going to let me in there because I don't have semester filled in. Let's fill in semester here. We'll say this was a semester one. Okay, what do I want to show you out here? I want to show you the term, which is the third one from the bottom. That's usually kind of important. The government type here, by the way, this guy up here, it means exam type, believe it or not, just so you know. If your province or state requires this, you probably already knew that in all likelihood. Now, this is kind of you know labor intensive, right? I'm going and I'm looking at individual kids. I have seen schools use user-defined reports. You could use a user-defined report to print out the information that you moved. You can constrain that by you know semester, by year, all those sorts of things. Uh, that will probably make it more manageable. And frankly, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much semester end update. You upfront verify the correct data is in place. You make the correct choices on the actual semester, uh, the semester end update form. And then you run the report from that form. And then you come and you verify that things look good. You make data changes if needed. And then you can actually do the semester end update. And then you verify that student history does, in fact, have the data you think it should. Now, about 55 minutes ago, I said I'd get you out of here well short of an hour. And I didn't do as well as I had hoped to. I, I thought I'd be a little farther along than I am now. I just want to take the next couple minutes, of, and it'll just take a couple minutes, I promise. Because I wanted to talk to you about something that's a little bit larger than semester end update. And I wanted to offer you some advice, because I don't want you to end up in the ditch. Here's the thing. Um, this was kind of sparked by a recent incident, frankly. And I've always had this idea, and some of you folks already do this. I know some of you guys do this, but I was reminded again because of this recent incident. It is my humble recommendation for all processes, not just the semester end update, but all processes, like print report cards, any of the stuff that takes more than you know a couple minutes. If I were involved in SIRS or school logic at a building or a district, I would have a three-ring binder full of notes and stuff. And I would have screenshots of the choices I needed for any major process, like semester end update or report cards. And now I'll admit that what I'm going to tell you next is an extreme example. It doesn't happen very often. But it did happen to one of our clients in the last few weeks. One of our clients, their primary school logic operator, got hit by a car. It was fairly serious. By the way, praise God, she's doing better now. But I'm pretty sure that when she was in the hospital, she wasn't phoning her coworkers to tell them which choices to make on the report card forms. I would suggest to you that you need to train multiple people on your staff to be capable of running our products. And you have some kind of Bible, some kind of thing that's got screenshots of the choices that you make for your unique situations. We like to think our products are highly customizable. So the choices you make to run report cards or transcripts might not be the choices your neighboring district makes. So having on paper screenshots of the proper choices and some explanatory notes, I just think that makes a ton of sense. Like I said, I don't want you to end up in the ditch. I want your headwinds to be minimal. I want your trails to be smooth. As usual, if you wish to review this presentation or share it with a coworker that couldn't make it today, wait till Monday or so, and by then I'll have this webinar up on the internet. You know, I think this interweb thingy, this internet thingy, I think that's going to take off. And you know where to find us up there. We're at community.schoollogic.com. So hey, thanks for coming in today. I really, really appreciate your time. I hope you found this helpful. I hope you found this was good use of your time. And I hope you have a terrific afternoon.